Welcome back to my channel. Uh, so today's video going to talk about my pathway to becoming an atheist. It's probably fairly common, I guess, in the atheist YouTube community to talk about how we got here, and I'm no exception. Um, I don't think I've quite heard anybody's story similar to mine, so here we go. I was raised Lutheran. Uh, my mom was raised Lutheran, went to parochial schools, did the whole stuff. Um, my dad was raised Catholic, but went to private schools, um, but still did like catechism and all of that stuff. Um, I found out later that when they got married or before they got married, my dad went to special education courses at my mom's church so he could convert so they could get married in the Lutheran church and Lots of family drama over the years over that from my dad's family. As much as it would probably hurt my mom to hear this, we were basically holiday Christians. Because um, basically we went to the sunrise service for Easter and then the mass or the midnight Christmas Eve ceremony for Christmas. And that was about it. Like we might go if our relatives in town insisted, but beyond that, we didn't go to church. I was fine with that. I very much preferred staying home and sleeping in or not going out into the cold. And yeah, it just never really resonated with me. Like the singing was nice, but beyond that, like I wasn't huge on it. Um, and I think my mom kind of blames herself for me being an atheist because of that. But I mean, once you hear my story, I don't think that would have helped anything or fixed it. As a kid, I probably would have identified as a Christian. And gradually, that shifted into just a generally spiritually focused. Uh, so probably around middle school, high school is when that happened. Um, I found a quote that was talking about trying to reconcile all the world's religions how can we have all these different religions and how can they all be true? And this quote basically went on to say that everybody, all the world's religions are standing in a ballroom and they're all around this big chandelier. And this big chandelier is God and its light radiates out to all of us. And so everybody standing around the ballroom has a different perspective on God, and as such, have a different interpretation of God. Um, so God, Allah, Yahweh, Zeus, whatever, you know, it's all the same thing we're talking about, but just different interpretations on it. And then in this view, atheism is just denying the existence of the chandelier. And middle school, high school me thought, you know, this was a pretty good explanation for how we have all these different religions, but, you know, we're all people and we're all in the same universe, so this is this is how it fits. That's about where I was with things when I was in 10th grade, so I was 16 at the time, and my dad was 50. One night, his heart unexpectedly stopped. Um, so prior to this, he thought he was having, like, a potassium deficiency issue. I guess this had happened when I was really little. So before I remember it happened and he went to the hospital, got sorted. It was a side effect from one of his medications. So he thought that was happening again. Let me know, went to the hospital and then we didn't hear anything. So when my mom got home from work, I told her what was up. We went to the hospital. They take my mom back, leave me in the waiting room. And apparently they, my dad got to the hospital, was talking with the staff about feeling better, and then just dropped. His heart stopped. So they worked on him for something like 20 or 30 minutes, trying to get his heart going again. I don't know why. I didn't know why then. Um, for some reason, maybe like educational shows or something, I knew that like 10 or 12 minutes without oxygen, like the brain doesn't handle that well. It's called hypoxia. So I couldn't understand why they would keep working on him after that, but 
they got his heart going again, but he was in a coma. And I mean, that first night in the hospital in the ICU with him hooked up to everything and seeing him hooked up to everything just burned into my brain forever. Um, I knew that my dad that I had known was going to be changed if he ever came out of this, if not gone. Um, Because we don't do good without oxygen. We need it. And our brain suffers. And, I mean, there's a couple really bad instances with him in the coma, but maybe that's for another video. Maybe that's just something I carry with me. Anyway, two weeks later, he was transferred to, like, the long-term care ward. He was stable enough that he was taken off the life support stuff. Um, and thankfully, he died. He just, I guess, passed, and they didn't resuscitate again. I'll use this as a moment to say, like, make sure your loved ones know what you want done. Apparently, so I'm an only child. Apparently, I was the only one to know that he didn't want to be kept alive long-term on machines. He didn't tell my mom. Good job, Dad. Um, anyways, make sure your loved ones know your wishes. That's all I'm going to say. At this point, I was still generally spiritual-ish. Um, kind of everybody's right in their own way. And then undergrad, got into psychology, and I heard about it in intrapsych, but it sort of just floated around the back of my head for several years. Basically, when you take intrapsych, one of the people you hear about in the neuropsych section, if your teacher is worth their salt, is this guy called Phineas Gage. Phineas Gage was a railway worker late 1800s. You know, we're trying to connect the country with rails. His job was to smush down the explosives down into holes, and then they would, like, lead out the detonation line or whatever and explode it. Um, so he's basically sitting there with a rod, packing down explosives. And so one day, he's doing this, and it hits too hard, or it was packed wrong or something, and the explosion sends a rod through his head. Somehow didn't kill him. Went through the roof of his mouth, took out an eye, and went through what we now know is the frontal lobe. Prior to the accident, Phineas was a church-going man, faithful to his wife, very kind-spoken, wouldn't hurt a fly, you know, that sort of person. After the accident, he started sleeping around, so there goes the faithfulness, um, became very coarse, Harsh language, um, quick to anger, would hurt a fly. Uh, you know, very big difference between pre and post accident for Phineas. We now know that the executive function processes happen in the frontal lobe and these help regulate behavior, especially like pleasure seeking behavior or sort of inappropriate behavior, like filtering and censoring yourself. Uh, to make sure you're not just talking like a sailor all the time. This was damaged in him, and as a consequence, he changed. So in grad school, the first year, thinking about this, learning even more about the brain, I came to a point where there was something I couldn't reconcile. And this is what it was. In one of the videos from my old channel that I'll put up, I'll talk about philosophy and different views on the mind-body problem and what that actually is. But basically, you can break it down into two camps. The one camp are called the dualists. And dualists believe that you have some sort of thing that is not of the body, and then you've got the physical body. And so the physical body includes the body, the brain, all of that. And then consciousness is tied to like some ephemeral thing that will live on after death. Uh, there's different interactions, but basically you've got two things here. And one is basically the soul or spirit. 
Then you have the monists. These people say there's only one thing. You can say that there's only the spiritual or this ephemeral thing. And I think people who argue that we're living in a simulation or a matrix uh, would probably go with this argument that it's all code. But there's also the materialists who say that you have your body, you have your brain, and your consciousness is a process that happens in the brain. So when you die, that's it. Okay. So the thing I couldn't reconcile is sort of what happened or could have happened with my dad, what happened with Phineas Gage, and what happens to a lot of people who have some traumatic brain injury or event. You have the person who was before, and you have how they act after. Sometimes it's not a huge shift, but sometimes it can be a drastic shift like in Phineas Gage. What does that mean for the person's soul? like Christian sense of a soul. So I saw a couple explanations for this. One, you have the soul that they're born with. Accident happens. The person that they were, that soul that they were, who, and let's go with Phineas, was a good, kind Christian man, is gone. That's off to heaven. And then a new soul comes in, assumes those memories, and is now the coarse, harsh, womanizing person who probably, according to different interpretations, would go to hell. So that's one sort of kludge of an explanation. Another explanation is that the person's spirit stays throughout all of this and this sort of is going with a deterministic view of the universe. They were always going to end up at this point of being a harsh, sleeping around person who is not living a very Christ-like life, and that was always going to be their end point, and so they're judged to hell and damnation for that, even though the first part of their life, prior to an accident that isn't necessarily his fault, prior to that, you know, he would have been welcomed into heaven. That doesn't seem very nice. Um, And that's sort of a deterministic view of the universe. At creation, God decided the path for everybody of all the universe, of all the atoms. And it doesn't matter what you do. And it's going to go where it's going to go. And free will is an illusion. I couldn't come up with a good explanation for the changes that happen after an accident that drastically alter a person's functioning and personality and the relation to their soul and how this could make any sense at all. And as I thought about it, like the necessity of the soul for consciousness became, it just evaporated. And eventually when that went So did the need for a God, you know, this universe is here in my current understanding of things. The universe is here from processes. We don't fully understand why the big bang happened, but it happened. And we know about the evolution of the universe, uh, the evolution. Well, evolution isn't the right word, but the formation of the planets and the solar system and evolution of life on earth and how we got here. And, One of my research interests actually is consciousness and understanding conscious experience of things. One of the books I'm planning on reviewing is The Quest for Consciousness, where the author, um, Koch, talks about how possible neurological underpinnings for conscious experience. That is sort of one of the holy grails for neuropsych, understanding consciousness, because it is a weird thing. Um, being able to feel as a person and do things and remember them and interact with other people. It's, it's something cool and unique and we're trying to understand it. We don't fully understand it yet, but that's okay. I will take that we don't know yet and we might not know fully how consciousness happens over sort of Pascal's wager where 
it'd be safer to bet on a god and go through the motions than to find out that it was a waste of time and money. So yeah, that's, that's how I ended up an atheist. And yeah. So if you guys have similar stories, different stories, I would love to have a discussion in the comments about this. Um, I am getting an F on this YouTube -y thing. Uh, like, comment, subscribe. Check out my Patreon if you want to support the channel and further videos on this sort of thing. And yeah, see you guys in the next video. You being an atheist. Whoop. Where are you going? Bye bye. Not today.